Good afternoon, everyone. It was an awesome lunch. Everyone awake? Everyone awake? Yes. Oh, I'm glad. Or else I'll go just go to sleep, you know. Uh, I really like the lamb there. It's really, really tasty. Yeah. So let's get into the game. Uh, my name is Sai and I work for ThoughtWorks. Uh, it's been like uh, four, four and a half years with ThoughtWorks. Uh, and overall, I have like about nine years of experience as a QA. Um, and uh, I do a, quite a lot of open source work, contribute back to the community on my learnings because when I started my career as a manual tester, I actually learned a lot of, lot of things from the community like you all here. So I thought it's just not fair me just learning and just keeping it to myself. So I wanted to just give it back to the community. So I spent a lot of my time on open source and stuff. And, uh, uh, I also maintain and contribute to the APM modules and Java client. Uh, so if there's anything that you want to catch up with me, I'm here around today. Yeah, that's me. Hello, everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Srinivasan Shekhar, APM member, maintainer, contributor to various other open source repositories. So if you have any doubts or questions, and if something is broken on Java client, feel free to poke me out. So uh, yeah, that's me. And Let's go ahead and see uh, native mobile commands in APM. So why native mobile commands? So we'll go ahead and see why do we need to talk about native mobile commands in APM. So from yesterday morning, we have been talking about web driver protocol, W3C standards. So this is some of the protocol. Uh, native mobile commands are some of the APIs which are defined in uh, APM side. Uh, which are not part of actual W3C APIs, or not part of the web driver spec itself. So we have got, there are platform specific APIs provided by Google and Apple. To give you an example, uh, for example, we have Siri in, uh, we have Siri in iOS. So a Apple exposes an API to interact with Siri, so which is not part of uh, web driver spec. Web driver spec designed by Jonathan, Simon, and other folks are completely generic, generic, generic enough in nature. So it is extensible to any platform, any browser, any IoT devices. So keeping everything in mind, it's designed as generic as possible and doesn't have a flavor of platform, doesn't have a flavor of uh, browsers, doesn't have a flavor of a particular iOS device or particular IoT platform. So uh, these are some of the APIs provided by platform vendors like Google, specific to their own automation libraries to perform a, probably to perform a gesture, probably to perform a CD interaction in iOS. So let's deep dive on what are the mobile commands that we have. And so let's deep dive into what are the mobile commands in iOS and mobile commands in iOS Android. Yep. Um. How many of you in the room actually use uh, Appium uh, in the mobile test frameworks in your organizations of Tried and stuff? Quite a lot of hands, please. Don't drop down, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, how many of your apps actually have gestures? Like you, you really have some test code uh, written in your framework which has got like some code for gestures. And uh, what are the APIs you use for gestures? How does your code look? Anyone just randomly like touch actions, uh, anything other than touch actions? Come on, anyone other than touch actions? Okay, so so it's been it's like everyone using touch actions if it's a gesture, right? So how many of you agree that the touch actions are so easy, just works out of the box, uh, it runs all the time? I don't consider them uh, all the time. Uh, and you're very super happy with it, it's given you all the flexibilities. Anyone? Okay, so partially, right? You're not like, apart from yeah. Vim, uh, it's just you're partially like yes. happy, but everyone's unhappy. Like, why are you unhappy with the touch actions, the, the whatever we have currently in our mobile automation? Anyone randomly? I feel the same too. I feel the same too. Back days when I was, uh, you know, writing some uh, code for gestures, uh, it was really a pain for me as well. So I'm one of you guys there. Just Vim's very happy in the room. I want to catch up with you, Vim. 
so the biggest pain point over there was uh, it works sometimes, and uh, you get a 200 from the server, and, uh, and no actions actually happen on your screen, right? You look at the logs because you come back to the community and say, you know what, it doesn't scroll up. Can you get us the logs? Your log says 200, right? So you, got, you just can't give a log saying, which has got a 200 response, which means it has no errors, and it doesn't happen, no, no action performed on your device. What we tend to do, no, we're just going to close the issue because we can't solve the problem. And uh, some cases where uh, you try to have some complex gestures in your, uh, your app, uh, let me go back and tell you one of the applications which was automating was really crazy, which wanted a digital signature. You have to like just sign, and uh, that was like if I have to compare that with anything else, that was like a checkout feature with your entire app, right? So which means my end-to-end -end is just not achieved with that. Uh, I mean, we really couldn't do that, so we had to do a lot of workarounds, flicky tests, and 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 things. So I I just wanted someone to rescue me from that, and probably something really cool that we want to do, and uh, that's when. Um, we had the Actions API with, after the W3C protocol, which Srini was saying. Uh, so Selenium went into W3C, uh, Appium followed Selenium with W3C, and uh, we said, okay, anything on W3C standards is what we will follow. We made sure that, you know, from the community side, uh, let's go ahead and respect all the W3C uh, APIs, so which means we have to make some changes uh, in our code base as well, right? So, Yep, so we went ahead with action APIs. That solved the problem. I was able to like go ahead and write, you know, complete the flow of my digital signature, and I could actually completely do that using the action APIs. But again, uh, people who were there in the workshop should have seen the action APIs were pretty not straightforward. So there were a lot of uh, sequence, and you need to add a lot of actions, um, and all, all the crazy things, right? So typically, uh, it was like you need to at least write like 10 to 15 lines of code to actually just do a scroll up or a scroll down. You need to again get the coordinates, add some sequences. Um, you know, you need to press down, move, and all of that, and and you need to have your uh, write pauses in between because uh, XCUI says uh, you know a specific pause time, and uh, Android says oh you know the minimum timeout time for a double tap is 40 seconds. And XUI says it's 200 milliseconds and stuff, right? So which means you still have to, you know, go write some piece of code and, and things. That was really crazy, right? So let's go ahead and uh, sort of see how cool these uh, native commands are. And when I was talking to communicating to a lot of people, like, yeah, iOS is a pain, iOS does this and stuff. iOS also does cool things. They also expose good stuff for a testing. So let's go look at some of the uh, native uh, commands uh, which iOS actually has exposed, and uh, Appium has actually written uh, some of the uh, mobile colon commands behind those, and how easy they are to use. So just before deep diving into any of the native gestures, uh, can, uh, can you all tell me some of the gestures that you have used while interacting with your mobile application or the mobile devices? Can you all name few gestures that you have used? Pinch, swipe, scroll. Pinch, swipe, scroll. Yeah. Okay, let's take this in another use case, right? I mean, a lot of people said scroll. I had one pinch and swipe. So let's take this scroll. So even, even if it's your touch actions or your action APIs, let's say you have a list and um, there's a lot of data on the list and you have to typically keep scrolling, scrolling, and uh, let's, this, let's say there's a button at the end of the page, right? So what you tend to do is you write a while loop, you write a for loop, or whatever the loop is, whatever your logics are, you keep scrolling, you keep scrolling till the element exists. And all that you need to do is what? You just have to just crawl all the way down because your whole test case or your aim is to just hit the bottom so you can click that button, right? So this could be one case. There could be another case where, uh, you know, you'll have to just crawl, look for a certain element. It's still a valid uh, scenario. So let's root that out. Maybe only in this case, you scroll all the way down to the list. Uh, so you, have, you just have to click on that button, right? In such cases, we put them into the loop, we reiterate, yeah, is the button present now? Let's Let's give a scroll. A button present, not there, let's give a scroll. And, uh, you know, again, there's a call made to XCUI, it's quite slow, it performs. You know, with that time of you scrolling, that's not exactly what you want. All that you need to do is, you just need that button where you actually can go perform your click and, and things, right? So, why do we have to do all this crazy stuff just to get all the way to the bottom? Uh, scroll like 20 times because you don't do anything in the, you know, 20 scrolls and things. So let's look uh, one of the mobile native commands. 
uh, which uh, I was actually exposed, which is uh, XUI, and how simple that is, is the mobile colon scroll. So the mobile colon has got a, a lot of more, uh, yeah, you know, gesture specific stuff. So I'm going to be going to look at the second one, which is mobile colon scroll. You see how simple that is. You just say the direction you want to scroll up, you want to scroll down, and then you say execute script, and the script is a mobile colon scroll. And that is just going to scroll all the way down, uh, so you could find the button now. So you you can get rid of all your loops. So you you save a lot of time as well, right over there. So you can straight away just hit hit down all the way to the screen over there, and like pinch. Yeah, you, since it is native APIs, it is much faster. As well. Yeah, yeah, and it's pinch, right? I remember I had hard times pinch even on Actions API because I have to like like get like crazy coordinates because one has to go in X and Y in two different directions and then I need to like probably just zoom. So simple over here, it says mobile colon pinch and just give it a scale, that's it. And these are like very, very uh, tied up and coupled only to the iOS uh, platforms. If you ask me, will this actually work in my Android? No, they will not. So the, these commands will not work in Android. These are very specific to iOS. And that's the reason. So, so it's, again, uh, something which you really need to decide if you're using a, a cross-platform framework and your app is cross-platform. You need to see if you want to use this or you want to go back to Actions API so you, you could have the same code base which can work for both. But still, still, you can have the same code base using these gestures as well. It's just about the different APIs which iOS and Android actually provides to us. Maybe. Uh, uh, Let's look at uh, complex gestures. Complex gesture. So what do you want to look at as a complex gesture? Maybe double tap. Yeah, double tap. Maybe even a two finger tap. That's even more complex than a double tap. Yep. Has anyone done a two finger tap in, or even looked at it in your touch actions or anything like that? Like, like two fingers, you tap on a stuff. Yeah, so there's one hand there. Quite common use cases when you have a G maps or something integrated, you do two finger tap to zoom in. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the quite common use case where you use two fingers to zoom in. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I used to try this uh, back days using, uh, you know, touch actions, wow, it used to be so difficult. I had to like create multiple actions, uh, merge them, and and do all these uh, crazy things. And I used to always you know, keep my fingers crossed and start praying if my test has to pass for this specific, uh, you know, uh, action. Uh, and, and it has to just work and randomly works, randomly doesn't work. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it gives a 200, but nothing used to happen. And finally, I had to just get the, get rid of the test and, and I started manually just tapping that. Cool, at least I'm satisfied that something's working correctly in my app now. So let's, let's go ahead and see um, uh, how simple uh, that specific action can be performed. Uh, in, in, in these mobile colon commands actually. So if you look at the, the last one out there, it says mobile colon two finger tap, that's it. Just give the element where you want to perform the specific two finger tap and uh, you just say mobile colon two finger tap. And, and these commands would be sent down to XCUI and, and they actually take care. So which means your gestures are getting very, very, very simplified for you. Uh, using the native commands and uh, the similar stuff is for uh, double tap or could be even for your your taps you give your x and y coordinates where you want to perform your uh, taps that's just going to actually uh, perform your tap and, and how many of you feel now or feel relaxed that okay there is a solution which is is like very extremely simple than what we actually use now cool uh, so far we have seen about gestures on iOS, so another common use case that we use uh, on any platforms irrespective of iOS and Android is uh, switching between apps. So a lot of use cases that we see uh, in day to day apps where at least for payment BHP, we migrate from one app to another app, do the payment, come back to another app and see whether payment is successful or not. And there could be cases wherein if you are opening a link, if you have two browsers, a sudden pop-up saying we have two browsers which one do you want to operate with so go back and if you do a back and you come back to the existing app so a lot of common complex use cases are end-to-end -end use cases that we used to uh, we we are using we, we are used to in our day-to-day -day life when we are uh, doing any payment or switching between multiple apps 
or for example, uh, you are working on a particular app and you got a call from someone, just switch, a, uh, switch to the caller ID and then comes back to the original app. So let's talk about switching between multiple apps in iOS. So uh, switching between uh, multiple native apps or it could be a web app or it could be a, uh, even a settings app. So there are a lot of cases wherein we go and check the permissions of settings app in between and see whether your application has camera permissions or you are, we have given any other permissions to your applications and coming back to uh, original application, perform the action towards it. So this is a common end-to-end -end use case, use case which we tend to say uh, not automatable, but it is actually automatable using uh, native mobile commands. So yeah, and and just to add on that, uh, this is actually doable even in Android. So there's a different API for that. Yeah. Uh, it's just not that it's something new as in such. It's been there for qu quite some time where you can actually uh, start a new activity, just do some interactions, and you can fall back to your uh, old old activity. So which means identically that's also like switching between two apps. Uh, which is also supported in Android and, and that's been there for quite some time. There are two, three APIs involved in, in it behind the scenes. One is a launch app. If you have given the bundle ID of a particular application, it launches that particular app. If you wanted to close the app, you can use close API to close the app. Or if you wanted to check the state of the application, so it's open, close, and if you wanted to query the state of the application, we can use another API called query API state, query app state, which helps us to provide the state of our application back to user. Yeah. So okay. it helps us to switch between multiple apps. When you are having a control on one an, uh, another app, you can switch between another app, perform some actions on it, and then come back to another app. So yeah. Maybe a quick demo? Yeah, so that. So would you like to see a live demo or a recorded one? Live? Yeah, because I don't have a recorded one. <laughs> <laughs> So, so if you look at the API, I have given settings ID, uh, bundle ID of the settings app, which is uh, settings app is nothing but the <coughs> iOS settings app, which you use to check what all the applications we have installed or if you wanted to change the state of the application, we go back and check the state of the application in settings app. So I wanted to launch another application, which is the application under test. In between, I have to go to settings app, check whether the application is registered in Siri or not and then comes back to the original application and performs some gesture on it. And I have my uh, APM server running in my local. So let's go ahead and execute. So it opens a sample application. It just shows some pictures randomly and then it switches to settings application. Check whether this settings application has uh, Siri and uh, under Siri whether the sample application is registered or not. So behind the scenes it's installing web driver agent. This is the one of the painful stuff which we which used to happen in iOS. So it installs web driver agent it launches the application again, then switches the application back to the settings application, performs click on Siri, then checks whether shortcuts has uh, the original application under test, and just perform some other operations. So now we can easily perform switch between applications by using this sample apps, or uh, the APIs that we have. We have three APIs, just to reiterate, one is launch application, another one is close application, and next is querying the state of the application. Yeah. And, and these also work on uh, simulators as well as real devices. It's not restricted only just to work on simulators. They also work on real devices. Again, it's not restricted to platform as well. It works yeah. absolutely fine in Android as well. So uh, how many of you have uh, iPhones here? Okay, how many of you set your alarms using Siri? Okay, at least few hands. So Apple has recently exposed an API to uh, interact with Siri and test your application. Uh, nowadays we see a lot of applications have interacts, uh, interactions with Siri. 
So you can perform a, a gesture, or you, perf you can launch an application using Siri, or you can do some purchase using Siri. So when you say hi Siri, uh, so when I said hi hey Siri, what's trending? It's our PM just popped up in Twitter. So maybe a quick demo on Siri shortcuts. So a lot of applications now have uh, conversational UI integrated, uh, conversational AI integrated. So some of, uh, some of the Android applications have even Google uh, now integrated and now we have uh, Siri integration. Yep. So let's see uh, how do you interact with your application using Siri. So I have a sample application again, again at a live demo. So I have a sample application. If I ask the application, hey Siri, show picture. So in a previous uh, demo, we have seen click operation on show picture, it just pops up some picture on it. So if I say, hey Siri, show picture, it pops up uh, probably a picture. Let's Hey Srini, show demo. Yeah. <laughs> <Look at that. laughs> Hey Siri, show picture. Yeah, this is how it works manually. Let's go and, ahead and, and see. And the next that. time when you actually ask for the picture, it actually randomly picks another image. Yeah. So just make sure we have a nice all that. Probably the next time when the scripts run, it should be something else. So again, it launches the application, then installs WebDriver agent, then launches the application back, switches. To city and then. Oh, there you see. How many of you saw the Macau? It's cool, right? So we we could also automate uh, Siri, so which means you're just not tied closely just to the applications. What we have, just the functional stuff. Okay. Every time when you execute, it shows a different picture. So now we have uh, APIs uh, through native mobile commands. You can interact with Siri and perform a specific action in your application. Yeah. And uh, how many of you would get super excited if you know that we have uh, APIs uh, which can actually give you the performance of your app? So, and that's iOS, right? That's <laughs> iOS. Yeah, so iOS is, is got APIs uh, where we could actually measure your performance of your application. So basically, we have like uh, APIs for it where you say start profiling, da -da -da, go ahead, just perform your scrolls, clicks, or whatever you want to do over there. And then you can actually say, you know, start prof profiling. And that's going to give you a trace file for you. And you can actually drop the trace file into your uh, instruments or your, ex your Xcode, which can actually give this uh, pretty uh, dashboard for you so you know how your app is performing. So it, uh, this is Xcode, so if you go back to Xcode in your debugging stuff, you get this. And uh, if you really want to see which specific threads performing really crazy in my application, so you can just drop the trace file uh, into instruments, and that's going to give you all your main threads and, and, and stuff, whatever crazy things are happening in your app. And, and I think this is a, a very, very cool feature uh, in, in the mobile colon, which I actually uh, liked in, in XUI exposed. Yeah. So Apple does give uh, time profiling. So you can go ahead and see a specific series of time period. Uh, during the course of time period, what are the threads that got invoked and how much memory that it got consumed and which thread uh, leads to the spike in CPU performance. So uh, there are a lot of profiling that Apple gives us by default. So if you change the commands in native mobile commands, so it gives you a kind of uh, so trace file, as you said, if you open it in uh, instruments, Xcode instruments, it gives us a bird's eye view of how does uh, my application looks like, so in terms of performance. So if you deep dive into the tool and see uh, what are all the number of threads that got spinned up and uh, what is the exact code that leads to the spike in terms of memory or CPU or anything else related to performance, so it's quite easy to capture your performance during the course of your automation execution. So maybe I can show the piece of code. So there you are in line 83 we basically, so you actually in line 82 you say the profile name, whatever the profile name you want to keep. 
and uh, in 83 you say execute mobile call in start performance can you just scroll yeah start performance record and then you go ahead and do all your actions whatever your actual test cases are to, supposed to do and once that's done you can actually go back and uh, uh, stop your uh, performance record so ah, there you go so what we are exactly doing here is for the current process id uh, for a particular time out capture the time profile in xcode through xcode build tools so we can ask uh, we can ask it to capture memory profile as well so it gives us a maybe a trace zip file so if you look at maybe i can execute as well and it doesn't give you a, a straight trace file for you uh, all you need to do is uh, it returns you a, a base 64 string so you got to decode that back and write it into a trace zip file and uh, and you're going to have the trace file there if, if you look at the code we have a base 64 string which is written in trace zip file so i have performed some operations enabled performance log capture after the operation i am stopping the stop capturing the logs so we can see a trace zip file if you open this one in uh, instruments so it will give us a nice view of how does my memory consumption looks like for the particular app again this has been captured by xcode build tools nothing by apm and for a particular process id and not for all the process ids running uh, behind the scenes so it's completely specific to your application as well and uh, you know i know a lot of people raise hands saying that you guys use iphones and uh, what sort of lock you are using your iPhones? Like, how's your, is it a pattern? Or what sort of locks you use? Face ID. Bim, what sort of lock do you use? Face, yes. yeah. Uh, anyone uses pattern, anything else, or everyone uses face? Numeric. numeric, yeah. So we have a lot of people using face, numeric, yeah. So biometric. Bit, biometric, cool, yeah. So, uh, Apple also exposes a couple of APIs to interact with uh, uh, OS with a particular biometric or even the face. So it works only fine on iOS simulators, not for the real devices. So you can unlock your Apple iPhone or any of the Apple devices if it has a biometric enabled device. So they recently taken off the fingerprint recognition itself. Now we have face unlock, so it works perfectly fine for face unlock as well. And 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 again, it's a behind a mobile colon. So you say mobile colon send biometric match, and, and if you just you say it's a face ID true, or if it's a biometric with your old devices, you say biometric true. It's just going to consider that. It's just touch ID. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, before we and these are just not the mobile colon commands. You'll have to just go back and see there are like a lot a lot of mobile colon commands uh, for iOS. Didn't I say iOS also does cool stuff? I'm happy with that. Uh, it actually opened a lot of doors for testing, right? And uh, yeah, so just to summarize on uh, what we went through, we looked at uh, face unlock, we, went, we looked at you know, how you could actually profile your performances, how you can measure them, and uh, we looked at some of the cool gestures. Uh, that was like a big pain point for us, and uh, how easy it is for us to do that. And in gestures, we saw a lot of gestures like two finger tap, double tap, tap, swipe, scroll, and, and a lot of things. You should go back and you know take a look at the other mobile colon stuff for uh, iOS. Yeah, I would strongly recommend do that. Yep. So let's go ahead and see what's there on Android. So uh, Android recently on its developer summit has released a feature called Instant Apps. So if you know what about what is instant app, if you have explored instant apps, so if you go to Play Store, type any of the apps which has instant, instant enabled, for example, Candy Crush Saga. So you don't need to install your application, install the application on the device. It means you're avoiding a lot of applications getting installed in your device, but you can still try out without installing the entire application in your device. So if you click on try out, it just opens up an instant apps. You can still go ahead and see in the settings app sections, the apps that are got installed. You can see a minor version of it getting installed, but if you look at the list of apps, uh, probably it doesn't look over there. 
So it helps us to try out a particular application before even you get into, uh, uh, before even you install it and explore the application. So Candy Crush has enabled this feature. So if you wanted to try out Candy Crush, yeah, you can go ahead and try. Yeah. So these are some of the scenarios, how do you automate in case of Android? Yeah, just so, to, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to what Srini said on, on the instant app stuff, it just, just came top of my head is uh, uh, with the URL which you see there, uh, it's just not uh, the URL, like some random URL there. You need to actually configure this URL in your Android manifest files, which means your app should be prepped to be an instant app. So where you set in, uh, you know, uh, I think it's a instant app to true yeah. in your manifest file. And you need to know that what's the URL when you click it. It's a sort of a navigation stuff. So your developer should definitely do that. And you need to know what the URL is and the package for it to like sort of quickly open. Yeah. In Google. In Android, Google provides three ways to interact with your application. Uh, there are three ways to deep link to your application. One is instant apps. If you know the URL, if you know the package name, you can launch it through command line as well. So for example, if you have done some payments, you got the order confirmation mail. If you wanted to uh, check the order, you can land the, from the email, from the order confirmation email, you can land directly into your application orders page. Without even opening the home page, you can directly launch to that activity. That's another way of deep linking. So uh, an another way of deep linking, when we have seen switching between apps, if you have three or four browsers installed, or if you have three or four payment gateways installed, for example, you have three or four payment gateways installed, when you wanted to make a payment, it list gives us a list of uh, payment gateway uh, UPI options that is installed in your application. That's another way of deep linking again. So the three ways to deep link, one is instant apps, if you know the URL, you can land directly into your application. Uh, activity, next is, uh, next are the two ways where you can switch between multiple apps, and list the application, uh, you can go to the browser and launch the URL. These are three ways to launch it. And uh, Google also provides an API to perform these kind of uh, actions through deep link API, wherein you have to specify the package that you are going to interact with and the URL of the application, that URL of the activity that you're gonna interact with. So if you say these two informations, deep link take these two parameters and launch the particular activity, not the home activity. So there are a couple of Android APIs doesn't support these features. If you go slightly back, Android APIs doesn't support these features because it's quite new to the market. So what Android exactly does is, uh, you might have noticed it. When you are launching another URL, so from our application, it goes to <coughs> Google Chrome, launches that URL, and again it redirects back to that exact application. So Google Chrome access a bridge over here. So it goes to Google Chrome, launches the application, third party application. So that's another deep linking. If the API, Android API doesn't support this feature, it goes via Google Chrome. If Android API supports this feature and you have the application installed, it directly launches the application. And if you don't have the application installed, it take us to the Play Store. It take us to the Play Store for us to install the application. So these are kind of deep linking that is exposed by Android, and all these are all possible through deep link API through native mobile commands of APM. Cool. So let's look at another very uh, interesting API, which uh, is very specific to uh, Espresso Driver. Uh, most of you have seen these hamburger menus in applications, right? Like uh, Google Play Store has got that. Most of the applications actually have the hamburger menu. So what typically does is you either you go tap on the hamburger, so it just slides out. There's an also other way for you to is you just swipe, right, in the, in the opposite direction, so it just comes moves out. So previously with the touch actions, it used to be like you got to exactly find that, uh, you know, the coordinates, so which means you have to exactly go to the corner of your screen, then you move. So which means you do minus by divide, you multiply and you get these uh, coordinates and then you try to like try to work on that and uh, it's still pain, right? So with these APIs, uh, we have something called as open drawer API, uh, which works only with uh, Espresso driver, not with UI Automator 2. So what typically this does is as you see on the screen, so you have a gravity, so you, basically what the gravity does there is how fast you want to open the drawer. So you just set the gravity level there and uh, find the element, what's the element on which element you want to actually perform that action on. And then you say mobile colon open drawer, uh, that actually is going to just 
swipe it based on your uh, uh, gravity. So when you are doing these on um, Actions API, when you are going to perform a gesture uh, for these kind of drawers on Actions API, there are high likely that you will get element out of bound exception. So, so these are all the APIs that's been exposed natively to solve these problems. Yeah, yeah, and and especially, um, and I think they could get they could be some random uh, crazy errors like how Sweeney said it says uh, your coordinates are outside the screen and uh, you go crazy seeing those numbers and the exceptions and then you decide okay let let me debug reduce the numbers reduce the coordinates and stuff right so you can get rid of all the space and just start using these APIs if you've actually moved into Espresso driver. And again, it doesn't work on a lot of APIs. It works absolutely fine. Maybe it works absolutely fine. The Actions API that you use with uh, X and Y, it works perfectly fine. On this use case, it works perfectly fine on some devices, not perfectly on other devices. Uh, even if you uh, adjust the X and Y coordinates, it sometimes gives us element not found exception or ele sorry, element out of bound exception. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see another. API, uh, very specific to another trouble. So we try to bring in all these APIs, which is always a trouble for people to set, including me or Srini over here, uh, is uh, you know, trying to set a date and time uh, with uh, the default date pickers and time pickers. Oh, this is crazy clock, right? I hate this. Uh, it's giving me a lot of pain when trying to try to set some time, find the coordinates and stuff. I see a lot of people nodding head, yes. I, I know, I, I, I understand. Yeah, and uh, it's quite easy now. And again, this works only with the Espresso driver. Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple now. All that you need to do is, again, you just say mobile phone set date and just give the date parameter as you see over there, uh, which your, and what's your month and a date you want to actually set. And the uh, Espresso driver is gonna help you with that. So which means you no longer uh, need to inspect, get your Xbox, uh, yeah, and you have to do all those uh, uh, crazy reject stuff. You really no more need to do that. Just use these APIs, they're pretty straightforward and it's just gonna set the date out for you. And we even we have an API for setting the time. If you specify hours and minutes and specify the API set time, it just sets time for you. And it works perfectly. It, this has been exposed only on Espresso. It works perfectly fine on Espresso. Yeah. And if you have any custom components, then it's not recommended. If you have a custom date picker, there are a lot of custom date pickers available in market. And if you still have a custom date picker, you have to go through the pain. And uh, how many of you would love to see if we could do some profiling like the way we did in iOS, right? So Android can as well do that. Uh, and uh, Android can do it. And now APM is actually adopted to that. So which means where you can actually try to see what's your battery consumption when you're automating your app or how does your Wi-Fi look? Uh, how is your CPU information? So basically that's like your ADB shell dumps by battery, right? So yeah. what typically does that mean? How do we do that in APM now? So uh, we can execute any shell commands uh, that's been provided by ADB, Android Debug Bridge. For example, if you hit the command ADB shell services list, it gives us 100 per services that you can perform with uh, ADB shell. So if you uh, pick up battery, ADB shell dumps his battery, you can, cons you can get the information about the battery on the, your particular device. Maybe before and after execution, get the information about battery and see how much battery been consumed. Or a per series of interval, get the battery consumption using uh, mobile colon shell command and giving this command as dumb says, then you can get uh, battery information or if you wanted to get a memory information, probably you can use MEM info. It gives you the memory information as well. If you wanted to capture CPU information for a, how much percentage spike being achieved when you are executing the application or when you are performing complex actions on your application. So you can keep, you can easily keep track of uh, performance as well. Either it could be battery or CPU or memory. So if you hit the command, it gives you list of all services that Android debug with supports. If Android supports that service, you can go ahead and use it in mobile colon shell. That's so cool. Cool. And uh, we just picked like random three, four uh, APIs, uh, just keeping time in mind. But you need to go back to the docs and there are a lot and a lot of, lot of these uh, APIs which is exposed for both iOS and Android. So go into uh, Appium docs and take a look at it. Uh, it's just not this 
I think there are roughly about 40 plus mobile colon APIs for iOS and as well as Android. We might be thinking a lot of use cases pertaining to the application might not be automatable, but it is actually automatable. Quite a lot of cases been exposed or quite a lot of APIs been exposed by platform vendors itself. In case of Android, we have UA automator specific mobile commands. In case of Espresso, we have UA uh, Espresso specific mobile commands. The, the set date, set time are all specific to Espresso. So maybe go ahead and explore all these native mobile commands in APM. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So uh, all these APIs are not specific to any client. These are all completely defined. You can use, you can take any client, Ruby, Java, JavaScript, it works absolutely fine. It's already there in Java client. Yep, uh, in fact, the demo was on Java. So all this goes via JavaScript API. It doesn't go, we don't have a specific API. So, for example, if I have a specific API for interacting, getting the memory information, there are a lot of a lot of information that you can get. If you hit ADB shell service list, it gives me 120 services. We can't have the methods defined in the way that we wanted to. So, we wanted our users to experiment the APIs. So that's one of the reason why we wanted to come out of uh, uh, Touch Actions API. If you look at Touch Actions API and if you wanted to perform a swipe gesture, so it is defined in such a way that you have to give press, you have to apply press, then you have to wait for a second or some second, then you have to move to a specific location, then you have to perform the action. But uh, our requirement could be I can press, just move to, I don't need to wait for it. So that's how the touch actions APIs are defined. So if you look at actions API, so it is defined in a way that it is generic. I can configure if I wanted to wait, if I don't want it to wait, go ahead and execute it. In case of uh, mobile colon methods, uh, it's a, another simplified version of APIs provided by Apple and Google to interact with your application. So if you write a wrapper on top of it, it might make your life easier but may not be for all. So we wanted to keep these methods as generic as possible. I have a question. Uh, two questions. So uh, uh, <coughs> do we have uh, any idea when uh, this API is of, uh, when API exposed by, uh, this one, uh, 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 exposed by uh, uh, Espresso, it also will be, uh, will be uh, with uh, UI2, A2? Okay. No. So, UA Automator 2 is officially deprecated by Google okay. and still UA Automator 2 works fine. Google hasn't stopped the support. If you look at the code base, the code is still residing in and they exposed a specific set of APIs and the way Espresso works is it's a different team. Google support, uh, invests a lot of money and time in it and they expose a different set of APIs. They don't know each other first. Okay. So you say... Uh, now to the whole uh, uh, to, um, people uh, who are using APM to move on to uh, Espresso. Uh, and again, it depends on the context. The way forward in the future is going to be Espresso. Uh, maybe <coughs> Google can stop supporting it. They have deprecated it two years back. But still, the code base is there and they haven't working. Though they are not working on it, but it works absolutely fine. And a lot of workarounds been done at APM end as well. But way forward could be Espresso. That's when we wanted our community to explore Espresso rates, as many bugs as possible. So help the community to bring up Espresso in the state of how UA Automator 2 is now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, speakers. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. So, uh,